one of the wonderful things about preaching at St. Mary's is that there's often a beautiful work of art that goes along with our gospel reading. Just three weeks ago, we had the transfiguration in the back of the church. Then the week after that, the Assumption is the centerpiece over our altar here. And then today, we are talking about the giving of the keys of the kingdom of heaven to St. Peter, which is depicted in our stained glass window right here. My apologies to those who sat on the side of the piano, but I'll describe it. So in the image, we have our Lord quite literally giving literal keys to St. Peter. And then in the background, you can see a flock of literal sheep that are there. Of course, we don't see any of those things literally in the gospel today. But our Lord does say to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, what would a Jewish man in that time have thought of when he hears that phrase, the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Probably, being a good Jewish man, St. Peter would have thought of our first reading for today from the book of Isaiah, the story of Shebna and Eliakim. Not as popular as Elisha and Elisha, so may as well go over that story. So Shebna was, his official title, was the Asher al-Habayit, the one who is over the house. And that is an official title in their government of the time. In fact, there are archaeological inscriptions over tombs that we can see from over 2,600 years ago with that phrase, Asher al-Habayit. The one who is over the house is sometimes translated as mayordomo or the steward. Really what it was by the time of King Hezekiah was a prime minister. This was somebody who had authority to act in the name of the king and who worked for the king but was not the king himself. So it was like, kind of like a prime minister. The key that we're all used to is opening a front door, getting in and out, letting people in and out the, of the doors. The keys had an even bigger significance in those days because the key could also open up the storeroom. The storeroom was how you paid those who worked for you. So it, giving the keys to Shebna, the keys of David, the keys to the kingdom, was not just saying you're, you're able to let people in and out. It was like you're in charge of hiring and firing. You're in charge of giving out the money. Maybe a, a good allegory in our time or a good uh, corollary in our time would be who gets to sign the checks. That would be what Shebna was able to do. So it was a great position of power. And yet at the time, no one would confuse Shebna with Hezekiah, who was the king. Everyone knew if you asked who was the king, it was Hezekiah. Shebna was his helper. Likewise, St. Peter, as he's being handed the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he would think of himself in this role that Shebna has as the Asher al-Habayit, the one who is over the house, not the king himself. And of course, we continue to think that to this day. Our Lord is the king over his church. He is the only ruler over the Catholic Church. But he has handed on to men, to St. Peter, and to all of his successors, that ability to be the mayordomo, to be the steward, to be the one who is over the house. Now, in the time of Hezekiah and Shebna, this was because the king couldn't be everywhere and couldn't do everything. And that, well, how can we think of it in terms of the church? Because obviously God can do, be everywhere and can do everything. Well, it is because he wants us to be participants in his plan of salvation. We see this over and over again where our Lord uses the prophets or uses the judges, uses the kings, and then later uses the disciples and the apostles to spread his message even though he himself is perfectly capable of doing so because he wants us to be participants in it. And so some he chooses to be participants in the body of Christ as participants in the headship of Christ, which is that leadership role in the church. And this he gives to St. Peter with the keys. There's two things that the handing on of 
uh, the, really the taking away, the forceful taking away of the keys from Shebna and giving them to Eliakim can teach us about the keys even of St. Peter. The first is that these keys are transferable. So even though Shebna had that title of the one who is over the house, because of the way he was acting, not in accord with the will of the king, their wills were not together, he was kicked out. He was removed from his post. He was removed from office. And those keys were transferred to someone else. Well, certainly St. Peter would be thinking that, especially in that time, when he thought of the, those who were the rulers of the Jewish community, you would think of the Sadducees, those who were functionaries in the temple. But our Lord is saying, they have rejected me. They've rejected my true faith. I am giving you, Peter, and these disciples, these disciples will now have the keys to the kingdom of heaven because those keys are transferable and the king can do with the keys what he wishes. If he's not pleased with the steward, he can remove that steward and get a new one. Also, the transferable nature of the keys mean that Peter can pass down those keys to his successor and to his successor and to his successor all the way down to Pope Francis today. Second, what it teaches us is that those who receive the keys are not necessarily perfect human beings. Shebna was able to go against the will of the king, despite the fact that he was the king's right-hand man. What it teaches us for the church is that St. Peter and the other apostles and the pope and the bishops today are imperfect men capable of sinfulness. When our Lord says to him, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it, there are two landmarks that he's using in the region of Caesarea Philippi to contrast with. So in the region of Caesarea Philippi, the pagans built this temple to the god Pan over a very large rock. It's really like a big mountain, but also sort of a rock. And then down below, there's this pool of water. And that pool of water led to an underground river. And things that were thrown into the pool of water could either float there, or it could be sucked by the currents and then taken away underground. And there is a belief amongst the pagans that that underground river was the gates to the netherworld, was the gates to Hades. Because if you threw something in and it got sucked in that current, you didn't see it again. It was gone. So it must have gone to the underground, must have gotten pulled down into Hades. So there's a practice amongst the followers of the god Pan of throwing sacrifices into the water as a way of sort of divination, asking of the god Pan for some kind of answer or for some kind of petition. Now, sometimes these were animal sacrifices, and at certain periods in history, these were human sacrifices. So human beings would be sacrificed and bound and then hand, thrown head first right into the water. And then it was considered accepted or answered in the affirmative if that sacrifice was then sucked into that underground current and taken away to what they believed was the gates of Hades. And then, if it wasn't, then the petition wasn't answered. Of course, what this meant is there's a lot of uh, randomness in their beliefs, because who knows whether or not the current is going to suck away the sacrifice or not. Well, our Lord is contrasting this now with Peter and his church. Because remember, this is the rock that they're throwing the sacrifices from. And he says, not this rock, but you, Peter, are going to be the rock. And this is a rock that is a living church, a church that is able to respond and give clarity to the teachings of the faith, not one which is confused and I don't know if the sacrifice is going to be acceptable or not, if the god Pan is going to bring this down to the netherworld or not. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he contradicts himself. We don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's up to the randomness and chaos of nature. Instead, 
He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. So Peter is to give that clear and consistent teaching from Christ. Now we know with the example of Shebna that those who are in positions of authority are sometimes not always perfect. And so where do we look to to get the clear and consistent teaching when sometimes there can be confusion? If you're watching the Catholic news nowadays, you can see videos from uh, India, if you follow news in that part of the world, and the Syro Malabar Church and some of the chaos that's going on there right now. Uh, long story short, so the Syro Malabar Rite is part of the Catholic Church. Um, St. Thomas the Apostle landed on that side of India uh, after the ascension. So that part of India, the St. Thomas Christians, have, has been Christians for uh, way longer than any of my ancestors. So my, my mother's side is, is Irish, my father's side is Polish. So uh, they didn't hear the gospel until St. Patrick, you know, in the, the sixth century. And then and Poland, the bap baptism of Poland happened around uh, 1000 AD. In, in India, uh, they, they were Christians for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the Irish or the Polish ever even heard the name of Christ. So this is an ancient church with ancient customs and traditions. Uh, there's discord between especially the bishops and the priests and certain priests and other priests, and they've been trying to change the liturgy and it's been resisted. And so you'll see these, these videos of priests fighting other priests on the altar at Mass, during Mass. Uh, the Pope sent a papal delegate to try to calm things down, and uh, his entrance into the church was blocked by a crowd of people, and people were throwing objects and stuff as the papal delegate was trying to get in, and so the police had to take them in the back door. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of chaos, a lot of discord going on, and unfortunately, that is what it means to have a human church at times. But we don't have to be afraid of the gates of the netherworld finally overtaking the church because we have the clarity of that teaching. I like to say we put the organized in organized religion. And there might be discord amongst, in that case in India, the, the, the bishops and the priests or some movement of priests with other priests. There might be discord in the community. And yet we are never unsure of what is the truths of the faith. It is always clear. We have the ex cathedra statements from the Pope. We have the ecumenical councils. We have the binding force of tradition. These things give us a sure guide. And this is our rock, so that we are not left in the position that the pagans were with the god Pan. Is it going to be up to chance? Is it going to be up to chaos? We don't know what the truth is. We don't know what the god is going to respond with. No. We have a rock, and that is what our Lord has built the church upon. Today, you and I get to make the statement of faith that St. Peter makes in the gospel today. When our Lord says, who do, you, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You and I have the chance to say that today when we go up for communion. When the priest holds up the host and says, the body of Christ, we make a proclamation of faith by saying, Amen. And this is what our faith is based on. This proclamation of faith in Christ, who is the king of his church. He is founded upon a rock, and the gates of the netherworld will not prevail against it.